Carnap, 1891 to 1970. The philosopher who tried to work out in greatest detail and with the greatest technical sophistication at his command the program of logical positivism and the idea central also to Russell's work of achieving a logical construction of science from experience was Rudolf Carnap. It was in response to Carnap that W. V. Quine developed an inf influential alternative view, which was in important part premised on repudiation of the concept of the analytic synthetic distinction central to positivism, this being the distinction between statements of logic and mathematics, whose truth or falsity is wholly a matter of the meaning of the terms occurring in them, and empirical statements about how things contingently are in the world. Carnap was born in Ronsdorf in Germany. At Jena University in the years before the First World War, he studied physics and attended Freya's lectures on mathematics and logic, and also studied Immanuel Kant intensively with Freya's friend and colleague Bruno Bach, a leading figure in the Kant Society of Germany and editor of its journal Kant Studien. Carnap said that he and Bach spent an entire year discussing Kant's critique of pure reason together. In the war itself, Carnap served at the front, returning to Jena University afterwards to complete his studies. His thesis on space was said by the physicists to be too philosophical and by the philosophers to be too physical. It was submitted in 1921 and the following year appeared in Kant Studien. At a philosophy conference in 1923, Hans Reichenbach of the Berlin Society for Scientific Philosophy introduced Carnap to Mortis Schlick, who invited him to visit the Vienna Circle. He did so and was subsequently offered a post at Vienna University in Austria. As known in the account of logical positivism above, he played a leading part in formulating the circle's doctrines and promoting its activities. In 1928, he published two books, the first being The Logical Structure of the World and the second, Pseudo Problems of Philosophy. They were published together in English translation, which are classics of the positivist outlook and program. In 1931, Carnap took the chair in philosophy of science at Charles University in Prague, and was visited there by Quine, among others. Half a century later, Quine, by then very old and a grandee of philosophy, revisited, visit, revisited Prague at the invitation of its philosophers and was taken by his excited host on a car journey to visit the house where Carnap had lived. When the car drew up outside, Quine peered out of the window and said, This is not a ha the house. The consternation of the Prague philosophers, as reported to this author, who was present on the day, was great. The rising threat of Nazism pr prompted him to leave for America in 1935, taking a job at Chicago University and later at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and at the University of California. Carnap worked on logic and semantics, modality, which is the logic of possibility and necessity, probability, and the nature of scientific theories, publishing influential work on all three topics. His influence on Quine and many others, whether directly or by stimulating productive disagreement from them, was extensively great. Quine's own view of the history of 20th century philosophy is instructive. Writing of Carnap after the latter's death in 1970, Quine said, quote, I see him as the dominant figure in philosophy from the 1930s onward, as Russell had been in the decades before. Russell's well-earned glory went on mounting afterward, as the evidence of his historical importance continued to pile up, but the leader of the continuing developments was Carnap. Some philosophers would assign this role rather to Wittgenstein, but many see the scene as I do. End quote. The language of scientific theories, Carnap argued, consists of sets of both logical and non logical expressions, the former of logical expressions resting on axioms and rules of inference in the standard way, and the latter non-logical expressions resting on a set of postulates that specify their meaning. Rules and correspondence connect the non-logical expressions to a domain thus providing an empirical interpretation of the theory. The non-logical expressions themselves divide into those that are observational and those that are theoretical, distinguished by falling under two kinds of laws, respectively empirical laws and theoretical laws, Objects and their properties that can be observed and measured fall under empirical laws. Theoretical laws 
deal with non-observable objects and properties inferred from empirical observations. The line between them is not always clear, but one can identify focal cases of each. The gas laws, for example, predict an observation. Brownian motion of motes of smoke in a glass jar can be observed as an effect of the behavior of the molecules constituting the gas. Phenomena of the kind theorized by quantum mechanics, by contrast, for example, the action of gluons in holding quarks together in hadron particles, cannot be observed, as this suggests the distinction between empirical and theoretical laws is largely predicated on the scale of phenomena under investigation, as the behavior of macroscopic phenomena invites more and more refined theory about microstructure, so the laws become increasingly theoretical. This distinction is, however, very problematic. There are good reasons for thinking, as already suggested, that even the most innocuous-seeming observation statements about macroscopic entities, motes of smoke, elephants, planets, are in fact theoretical, or at least heavily theory-laden. After all, how the world seems to us in everyday experience is a construct out of the interpretations our brains make of incoming sensory st stimulation, and these interpretations are based on theories about what the incoming data might be conveying about the entities and events that are outside our skulls, which we take to be the stimulation's causal origin. This problem might in turn be addressed in various ways, for example, by accepting that observations are theory-based interpretations, but nevertheless differentiating them from classes of statements whose inferential distance from sensory stimulation requires additional non-stimulation-related features, such as hypotheses whose plausibility turns on how they organize our interpretations of our experience. But the distinction on which the entire Carnapian structure turns, that between analytic and synthetic statements, was made to seem even more problematic by the attack on it mounted by his student and friend W.V. Quine. Quine, 1908 to 2000. Willard Van Orman Quine, known to his friends and colleagues as Van, was born in Akron, Ohio, then the rubber tire capital of the world. His father was a successful businessman in that industry, a hidden connection with wheels might have prompted Quine's great love of travel. It was his ambition to visit as many countries as he could, even if it meant just putting a foot over the border so that he could say that he had been there. It was suggested that his autobiography, which is far more about his travels than about his philosophy, should accordingly have been called a moving van. His aptitude for logic began early. He wrote, I may have been nine when I began to worry about the absurdity of heaven and eternal life and about the jeopardy that I was incurring by those evil doubts. Presently, I recognized that the jeopardy was illusory if the doubts were right. At Oberlin College, as an undergraduate studying mathematics, he heard of Russell and mathematical philosophy and was enraptured by it. Another significant influence was the behaviorist psychology of J.B. Watson. Both shaped his philosophical outlook. Because, because A.N. Whitehead was by that time teaching at Harvard University, his association with Russell prompted Quine to apply for postgraduate study there. He began his studies under Whitehead's apparently nom nominal supervision in the autumn of 1930 and completed his Ph.D. in just two years. Its title was The Logic of Sequences, with the subtitle A Generalization of Principia Mathematica. Decades later, a festschrift was prepared for Quine, and his long-standing friend and colleague Burton Drebin chose to write about Quine's doctoral dissertation. He found something in it he could not understand, and therefore wrote to Quine about it. Quine found that he could not understand it either, and wrote back, quote, There is no fathoming the subdoctoral mind. A similar story is told of the poet T.S. Eliot, who wrote a doctoral thesis at Oxford on F.H. Bradley's philosophy. When it was suggested Long afterwards that he published it, he reread it and found that he could not understand a word of it. A.J. Ayer claimed that when he was in the grip of a high fever in Sierra Leone during the Second World War, he had been posted there as an intelligence officer. He understood Kant, but on, re on recovering found that he had forgotten what he thought he had understood. These anecdotes show that sometimes philosophical insight arises at moments of intense immersion in thinking about a problem but the insights can be elusive when one is no longer in that frame of mind. 
Uh, Quine won a traveling fellowship in consequence and went to Vienna, where he attended Schlick's lectures and meetings of the Vienna Circle, meeting Kurt Gödel, A.J. Ayer, and F Friedrich Weissmann there. He hoped to meet the great Wittgenstein, as he described him in a letter to his parents, knowing that although Wittgenstein was at Cambridge, he might return to Vienna in the summer. In the event, he never met Wittgenstein. Quine went to Warsaw, also meeting the logicians uh, Stanislaw Linuski, Alfred Tarski, and John Lukas Viss, and to Prague, the most significant part of his visit, for here he attended Carnap's lectures and had many hours of discussions with him. I eagerly attended Carnap's lectures, Quine wrote. He was my greatest teacher. I was very much his disciple for six years. In later years, his views went on evolving, and so did mine in divergent ways. But even where we disagreed, he was still setting the theme. The line of my thought was largely determined by problems that I felt his position presented. With the exception of service in the United States Navy during the Second World War, Quine's entire career was spent at Harvard University. In a long life, he lived to the age of 92, dying on Christmas Day in the last year of the 20th century. Quine published over 20 books and scores of papers contributing to theory of knowledge, logic, philosophy of language, and philosophy of science. He was showered with honorary doctorates, awards, and medals, and was probably the most publicly honored philosopher of his century. The two central commitments of Quine's philosophical outlook in the 20th century are naturalism and extensionalism. His naturalism consists in regarding natural science as offering the best accounts we have of the nature of reality and how we find out about it. Thus, science provides us with our ontology, or what exists, and our epistemology, our theory of how we know. Because science is always open to revision in the light of new evidence, he was a fallibilist in epistemolo epistemology. He rejected the idea that there is a philosophical platform outside science from which the assump assumptions, methods, and theories of science can be examined for purposes of justifying or criticizing it. To accept that science provides our ontology on what exists, our view of what exists is to accept physicalism, the view that what exists is what is describable in physical terms. That, of course, entails that there are no non-physical entities such as gods or Plato's forms, and in particular in the philosophy of mind, that all mental phenomena are or rise ca uh, causally from physical phenomena only. And cor correlatively, it means that the associated epistemology is a thoroughgoing empiricism, but there is one surprising tweak to Quine's naturalism. He felt obliged to add one category of extract entities into his ontology, namely sets, which are acquired for mathematics. And since science is impossible without mathematics, we are forced, said Quine, to accept that sets exist as well as physical things. But this is consistent with Quine's other comment, which is to extensionalism. As noted in connection with Freya's solution to the puzzle about context in which co-referring terms cannot be inter-substituted, inter salva uh, veritate, an extensional context or language is one where such inter-substitution can happen without trouble, whereas an in in intentional context uh, is one where inter-substitution can change the truth value of the sentence in which the term terms are embedded. Cicero wrote, the animictia is true and remains so when Tolly is substituted for Cicero, but Tolly cannot be substituted for Cicero, and Tom believes that Cicero wrote D and Missitia because where whereas it might be true that Tom believes that Cicero wrote D and Missitia, if he does not know that Cicero and Tolly are the same person, it will be false that he believes that Tolly wrote D and Missitia. Quine held that the only acceptable languages are extensional, and that attempting to explain anything, whether logic, science, or language, using such intentional concepts as meaning or analy analysity or modal notions such as poss possibly and necessarily, is mistaken. It might not be f sufficient for understanding a theory that it be extensional, but it is necessary. The paradigm of an extensional language is predicate logic, and it can be used to ascertain the ontology of any given theory by paraphrasing it into logical terms in a manner similar to Russell's treatment of sentences containing descriptive phrases. Anything X that the theory quantifies over, that is, uses a quantifier to say there is at least one X, is being claimed by that theory to exist. Quine encapsulated this in the slogan, 
To be is to be the valuable, or to be is to be the value of a variable. Note that what a theory is prepared to quantify over tells us only what that theory says exists. It does not tell us what in fact exists. If for other reasons we do not have grounds for accepting the existence of the X in question, then that is a reason for rejecting or adjusting the theory. We use our best available scientific theories to decide what exists. Additionally, Quine required that for anything to be a legitimate entity, it must have clear criteria of identity. That is, it must be possible to distinguish a thing X from some other thing Y if we are to count X into our ontology of what exists. He demonstrates this by showing how something without clear identity criteria fares under examination in a case um, a possible fat man. Take for instance the possible fat man in that doorway and again the possible bald man in that doorway. Are they the same possible man or two possible men? How do we decide? How many possible men are there in that doorway? Are there more possible thin ones than fat ones? Is the concept of identity simply inapplicable to unactualized possibles? But what sense can be found in talking of entities which cannot meaningfully be said to be identical with themselves and distinct from one another? His slogan for this principle is no entity without identity. The amusing and pointful possible fat man example occurs in a paper in Quine's from a logical point of view, published in 1953. The title of this book comes from the refrain of a calypso made famous by Harry Belafonte. From a logical point of view, always marry a woman uglier than you. <laughs> um, so I do, I do want to go back and talk a little bit um, about... That's okay. We'll just skip over it. We'll skip over it. All right. Well, in any case, uh, Quine's attack on the analytic synthetic distinction occurs in a famous paper entitled Two Dogmas of Empiricism, published in 1951, in which, although himself a thoroughgoing empiricist, he addressed the respects in which he thought positivism had gone wrong. One dogma is a belief in some fundamental cleavage between truths which are analytic or grounded in meanings independently of matters of fact and truth which are synthetic, basically, meanings that are dependent uh, on matters of fact and are, in, in actual sense, grounded in fact. The other dogma is reductionism, the belief that each meaningful statement is equivalent to some logical construct upon terms which refer to immediate experience. The rejection of the analytic-synthetic distinction, or basically uh, truth that are grounded in meanings independently of matters of fact and truths with are grounded in fact is a consequence of Quine's extensionalism because the idea of analyticity essentially turns on the intentional notion of meanings and is his question is what sort of things are meanings? Quine identified two kinds of statements standardly described as analytic, those that are logically true including tautologies such as no unmarried man is married and non-tautologous statements, such as all bachelors are unmarried. The former is true in virtue of the logical particles in it, no and un. The latter, although not as it stands a logical truth, can be shown to be one by demonstrating that the terms in it are synonyms, or by replacing one of the terms with a synonym, synonym to re reveal its underlying tautological character, for example, bachelors with unmarried men. Now, therefore, the question is whether there is a clear notion of synonymy available. Perhaps such a notion would be provided by means of definition, having it that two terms are synonymous if they can be defined in terms of one another. Might that work? Well, what are the definitions based on? Answer. Empirical observations by lexi lexicographers of the fact that users of the language treat certain expressions as synonyms such that one can be used as a definition for the other. But then definition is explained by synonymy and cannot without circularity be invoked to explain synonymy. Quine does, however, allow that definition can prescribe synonymy in the case of conventional introductions of new technical notations. If definition will not explain synonymy, what about intersubstitutivity? Salva verite. 
one can leave aside trivial cases such as the failure of the intersubstitutivity of unmarried man and bachelor, and bachelor has eight letters, and note that the more interesting fact that heteronymous terms like uh, non-synonymous terms can be in, in, intersubstituted salva veritate as when the morning star replaces the evening star in the in the evening star is Venus. As this shows, intersubstitutivity is not sufficient for synonymy. What about the suggestion that analytic statements, if there are any, are necessary? Because necessarily all bachelors are bachelors is true. If then bachelor and unmarried man are in, in, intersubstitutable, salva veritate, we can say necessarily all bachelors are unmarried men is true. And this in turn allows us to say all bachelors are unmarried men is analytic is true. And this says that bachelor and unmarried man are synonymous in the required sense. Quine rejects this as a hocus pocus on the grounds that Talk of necessity already presupposes a notion of analicity, and that in any case, modality is, in his view, deeply suspect. He also rejected Carnap's attempt to show that even if the notion of analicity is too vague in ordinary language, a precise formal language can be constructed whose semantic rules specify which sentences are analytic, these being the ones true in that language only in virtue of those rules. This notion is not, of course, a notion of analicity, only of analysticity in the constructed language, and therefore does not mean Quine's challenge. If there is no distinction between analytic and synthetic statements, because the notion of the former is incoherent, it follows that all statements are synthetic, even those of logic and mathematics. Quine accepts this conclusion. He has a metaphor to explain it, the idea of a web, the web of belief, whose outer fringes and only those outer fringes are directly in contact with the world through the sensory stimulations caused by the world, and where therefore our statements are revisable in the light of that experience. And of course, as you know, Quine wrote a book called Web of Belief. But the deeper we go into the web, the less and less effect those impacts have, so that at the center of the web, the statements of logic and mathematics seem to stand fast, as if irre unreversible. But if a big enough impact were to hit the web, the shock wave might penetrate even as far as the statements of logic. This view is a form of holism, the idea that the web of belief hangs together as an integrated whole and sustains itself as a whole. It challenges the other dogma, Quine found in empiricism, reductionism, the thesis that individual statements and scientific theories are supported or un undermined by particular observations relevant to them. Quine's holism resists this by arguing that Quote, our statements about the external world face the tribunal of sense experience, not individually, but only as a corporate body. Scientific statements are not separately vulnerable to adverse observations, because it is only jointly as a theory that they imply their observable consequences. End quote. It is a consequence of Quine's skepticism about meanings that one cannot say that the meaning of a sentence is the proposition it expresses, which had seemed a natural thing for some to hold. In particular, when we translate between languages and talk of sentences in different languages, meaning the same, what we make ourselves to be saying is that the sentences express the same proposition. We say that the same thing is said by snow is white and la ne is blanc, but argues Quine, consider a difficulty about translating from another language if you have nothing to help you but the empirical evidence of the native speaker's behavior and the environment. The translation manual you construct on this basis will be under determined by the evidence you gather. If the native speakers say Davagai every time they see a rabbit and point at it, the evidence does not settle for you whether they mean rabbit or favorite stew or beast of evil whim omen. Because this example focuses on a single word whose reference cannot be fixed precisely in the translator's language, Quine describes this as the inscrutability of reference, and Quine takes it that translation of theoretical sentences of the native speaker's language will not be merely underdetermined, but indeterminate, in that they will always be equally satisfactory translated by two or more sentences of a translator's own language. What the indeterminacy of translation shows, says Quine, is that the notion of propositions as sentence meanings is untenable. In Word and Object, which Quine published in 1960, Quine set out his alternative view, 
called linguistic behaviorism, arguing that the translator's task shows that we what we mean by the meaning of a sentence is the class of all sensory stimulations that prompt a speaker's assents and descents to the sentence. Meaning, accordingly, is stimulus meaning. You achieve a translation, albeit an determinate one, when a comparison of your and the native speaker's assents and dissents match in the same stimulus conditions. This applies to meaning in general. One can see from the survey of Quine's philosophical outlook that it is systematic and governed throughout by the fundamental commitments mentioned, naturalism and the idea that only extensionality provides clarity and determinateness, both of which are lost when intentional concepts of meanings and the modalities are invoked. It is a philosophical outlook much in harmony with a scientific age which, in philosophical terms, began with the developments in logic providing new tools for exploring language, thought, and knowledge. But all of Quine's key theses have been challenged in their turn, as one would expect from how things are in the lively and creative jousting ground that is philosophy. Some of these reactions are canvassed in latter pages. One of a number of significant respects in which this is so is that, contrary to Quine's hostility to them, the modal concepts necessarily and possibly have been given great respectability by Saul Kripke's provision of a semantics for quantified modal logic using the notions of possible worlds, defining necessarily as true in all possible worlds, and possibly as true in at least one possible world.